I gave the committee, the Savas committee, a list of topics that I'd be willing to talk about, and they chose this one. Uh, so perhaps you'll enjoy it as their choice among many. But I don't really see why I should give this talk on life after death, because you've all experienced it so many times. <laughs> if Bob is saying that we've experienced 8,400,000 human lives, that's a heck of a number of times that you have passed through what I call a golden door of death, because it is a golden door. Uh, you know, among Buddhists, they cry when a child is born, and they celebrate uh, death. They say, Buddh Buddhists are very realistic. <laughs> I was sort of more into Buddhism before Baba than any other. I studied all the major religions, but Buddhism is right down to the brass tacks. What are we doing here? Uh, you know, uh, we come down, and we go up, if you like, up and down, or in and out, or back and forth, endless, endless amounts of time. And it's really important to think that this life in the gross sphere is only half of your life. It's only half. The other half is just as important that you spend on the other side. Um, and I don't even like the expression, the other side. It's not the other side. It interpenetrates in this world. I think modern physics has given us a better idea uh, of, of, of that, that all these energy worlds interpenetrate. Like if you were a physicist now and you took a sample of anything here, it would be just all whirling atoms and tremendous amount of empty space. That's how you could look at this whole gross sphere that way. And we see it just because we have these physical eyes that limit us to a certain vibration of light. We just see as we see. We don't see all that microscopic world at all. And you, most of you, I would say don't see the other side, but it's right here. There are people in this room here who don't have gross bodies. They're here. They come to Baba Talks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they, they come to your meetings, and they're connected with us, and they can see us. And I thought I'd just sort of run through an average person and what happens to him. Let's say whatever age or whatever reason he drops the body, the cord is severed. And the Bob in the Bible, it says the silver cord, the golden bowl is broken and the silver cord is loosened or cut or something like that. The golden bowl is your body, physical body, and that silver cord, which feels like a cord, is the connecting thread between the subtle body and your gross body, and chop. And in medical terms, uh, that's, that's really death, when that cord is cut. And uh, what happens to most people, unless they're very heavily doped or drugged, uh, is that they lose consciousness for a short time, and then they gain consciousness again, and they see and hear just like they did before. Their sense of taste and smell is gone. Uh, you can see and you can hear, and usually the person, let's say you were dying in a hospital or a bed, some, some bed somewhere, you see exactly where you, your body is. You wake up and you look <coughs> at your physical dead form. And if you don't know very much about anything, average person doesn't, you'll stay on that view, just like uh, Ray there has his camera fixed on a certain view. Uh, you'll have a certain amount of area around that you see, and you don't see beyond. And you don't know what to do. You're sort of stuck. First you see all your grieving relatives, or the ambulance, or whatever you see. And then you stay focused on that area, unless there's someone on the other side who comes to help you uh, move away to change your perceptive uh, area. And the way that works is now you're just a mental body and a subtle body. You have no physical senses anymore. So how do you function now? You function 
with five, with the three senses, the two senses are very dim, the, the taste and the smell. And now to move, you can't, you don't have a physical body to move. You look down and you see that you think you have a physical body, but it's really an image projected by that subtle body. And so you seem to, to still be alive. And there are many, many thousands, millions of people who don't know they're dead. They don't know. They look and see. They feel normal. And they don't know they're dead. They say, That's a problem. <laughs> I'm serious. It's a problem. Uh, but if some friend comes or helper comes and says, yes, you, you, that corpse there, you, that's you, and you're finished, you're now in this so-called other side, uh, now come with me. And by their help, you might move somewhere else. But how you would do it on your own is you imagine another place to be. And it's just like here now, you're going to leave the camp and you imagine yourself at um, Ontario Airport or something. You visualize that and you go there. Here you have to get in the car and go or something. There you just think about where you want to go. And this accounts for the fact that many people, if they're dying away from home or something, they'll immediately think of home and project that uh, ethereal body and it travels at the speed of light at least, maybe more, uh, they'll, they'll suddenly be there. Because you travel at extreme speed, you know. If you thought, for example, of the tomb, you might do that, you'd be there after, after you've just passed away. But if you, don't, if you don't know that, or you don't think of, of a loved one or somewhere where you go, then you just linger in this area where you um, have died. And it's true if you come to a scene of an accident or a suicide, and I've had this experience, that the, the soul is still hanging around there. And you have to say, no, go on, go on, move, <laughs> go. And you usually call for help. Uh, this is one reason all religions you pray uh, for the dead in the sense, I never use the word dead, for people on the other side, so that they can move, so that someone can come and help them move because they don't know the simple fact of locomotion. And I'm trying to tell you, if you should, you know, drop your body tomorrow, fine, great, now move, you move somewhere.